Welcome to the talk on complex regional pain syndrome. This is the way we're going to structure the talk and I'll go through each heading in turn. So what is CRPS? Well this is where it starts, it's burning pain and in a couple of words ultimately it's an uncommon pain condition, it's severe, uh, it, there is normally a minor trigger, sometimes it can occur spontaneously and it leads to distal features or distal changes. But that, that, those flames they were to remind us that the key factor is it's burning. Um, and this is when it was first described uh, in 1864 by Sir Silas Mitchell who was in the American Civil War. And um, his famous paper, Gunshot Wounds and Other Injuries of Nerves, um, is where he first mentioned the term causalgia and uh, described how he looked after somebody that had complex regional pain syndrome. Now, causalgia is, um, consists, consists of two words, causus and algus, and the one is burning and the other is pain. So it's a burning pain, and those flames were there, as I've said, to remind you that that's a key feature of CRPS. Now let's talk a bit about the epidemiology. There's some interesting features of CRPS. Depending on what papers you read, the incidence can be anything between 5 and 25 or 26 per 100,000. Um, and there's some interesting epidemiological features which I'm going to go through. Um, it occurs more in females. The incidence increases until you get to about 70 years of age, so it gets worse as you get older. It's generally a condition of upper limbs, 60% compared to lower limbs, 40%. And ultimately, when people talk about CRPS, essentially they're talking about CRPS type 1, of which this occurs in 90% of cases, and we'll discuss the differences in a little while. It can occur on more than one limb, it can occur on opposite limbs, and there are a couple of other interesting things that occur. But that's the main epidemiological background of CRPS. Now the causes of CRPS can be multiple, and we all know mainly follows uh, minor fractures, minor sprains, where patients' um, distal extremities are immobilized. And there's the culprit, there's the um, fiberglass cast, and there's the other culprit from uh, days gone by. I haven't seen uh, Plaster of Paris for quite a while now. Um, and these are the two main things, really, something that gets, gets a distal extremity um, immobilized. There are a number of other causes that you can see there, so I've, I've divided them into uh, five headings for your ease. Uh, musculoskeletal, injuries to nerves and, and dorsal roots, injuries to the central nervous system. CRPS has been said to follow strokes, tumors, uh, brain injuries as well. CRPS can follow myocardial infarction, um, which has been described. And it can it occur spontaneously as well. So not only do you need, so some people don't even have a mobilization, but spontaneously get CRPS. Um, and there are a couple of other things as well, particularly elective surgery. And this is important for us anesthetists out there. Carpal tunnel syndromes, knee replacements have been documented causes of CRPS. Knee scopes, a minor operation. Uh, ankle and foot surgery as well. So elective surgery is something for us to think about, um, particularly those of us that do orthopedics. Now the clinical features, and again I've tried to keep it simple. There are negative features, there are positive features, autonomic features, and mototrophic uh, features or symptoms. Now when I talk about CRPS, the first thing I think about is, well, yes, it's a neuropathic pain condition. But recently, uh, Trolls Jensen um, did a, I can't remember if it was an editorial or an actual paper, I think it might have been an editorial in pain in 2011, where a new definition of um, a neuropathic pain has been posed. And they ultimately said, and this is a, a quite a good paper and it's worth a read, um, they ultimately said that neuropathic pain is a specific d disease entity which will be discussed elsewhere but complex regional pain syndrome and other so-called dysfunctional pain syndromes perhaps shouldn't be um, classified under the umbrella of neuropathic pain. Now CRPS is one of those and the other ones um, would be uh, vulvodynia and I think it is interstitial uh, cystitis or um, pelvic pain. Now 
So when you're talking about CRPS, strictly speaking, you may not call it a neuropathic pain syndrome. However, it's got features common to neuropathic pain syndromes. So this is still a topic of debate, and, and the new definition of neuropathic pain has only come out recently. Um, so people will still consider CRPS to be a neuropathic pain syndrome. And in my mind, it's still a neuropathic pain syndrome. But strictly speaking, probably not. Um, so there are negative features. Uh, hypoesthesia, uh, sensory changes, and then of course their positive symptoms and features, and that's the hyperalgesia and allodynias. And then the autonomic changes, so the, so the temperature and color changes that you see, and the edema and sweating changes, so vasomotor and pseudomotor changes. And then of course the mototrophic changes you have um, as well, which can be quite severe. Um, now this is a photo of somebody with severe CRPS and you can see there's that, 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 that is wasted, uh, contorted peripheral arm. Um, so much so that some of the people even neglect that, um, that periphery and I think it's called hemispatial neglect. So that, that's how severe CRPS can be. Okay, so the natural history um, and this is quite easy to think about. It, there, there could be an acute phase, there could be a, uh, an intermediate phase, and there could be a chronic phase. Now, acute phase, just for ease, is a warm phase. So it's edematous, it's vasodilated, it's swollen, it's glossy, it's red. The intermediate phase is a more co is is could be considered the cold phase. So that blue there is to remind you that intermediate and is, is a cold phase. Um, blue and cyanotic and then the chronic phase which is the motor and trophic changes not everyone displays this um, that, that, that that's important so don't wait to see one followed by the other but some can have it some it can occur quickly and some can, can occur slowly now in 1994 the ISP devised the um, uh, the ISP definition of complex regional pain syndrome and they divided it into two um, two groups CRPS1 the so-called reflex sympathetic dystrophy and CRPS2 so-called causalgia and there are many names out there um, including these two names and RSD reflex sympathetic dystrophy is what's commonly um, used however um, we should be calling it complex regional pain syndrome. That is what it's called. So CRPS1. I'll just go through it. Four aspects, four points. Noxious event, immobilization, followed by continuing pain, allodynia, hyperalgesia, and the pain is disproportionate to the ins ex uh, uh, event, triggering event. So that number two on, on CRPS is essentially the same thing as the number one on CRPS2. So there's pain, allodynia, hyperalgesia. So CRPS1, the third aspect is at some point there's evidence of edema, changes in skin blood flow, and pseudomotor activity. And that three for CRPS1 is the same as two for CRPS1. So edema, blood flow, pseudomotor activity. And then CRPS1-4, the diagnosis is excluded by any other condition that could account for this, is the same as three for CRPS2. So they're quite similar, except the main difference is the CRPS2, the causalgia, which follows a nerve injury, strictly speaking. And the, 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 the changes are not necessarily limited to that um, distribution of that nerve that is injured. So CRPS1, RSD, CRPS2, causalgia use the term complex regional pain syndrome. I'm amazed that I'm still getting referrals for um, patients with causalgia with RSD. So that's the 1994 definition, the ISP definition. Now let's move on to Budapest 2003. Uh, a group of pain specialists, a group of specialists got together and developed consensus criteria, um, consensus definition for complex regional pain syndrome. And these are the new, these are the new, um, these are the new criteria to, to diagnose CRPS. Um, they've been around since 2003 and they're still not commonly known and they're still not commonly used, but I, I pose to you that this is something we should be using. Now, the IASP taxonomy, the 1994 definition, was consensus guided and in 2003, following a series of papers, um, this group, I think it was led by Brule, um, had a look at the, the definition for CRPS. 
and they had a look at the sensitivity and specificity for diagnosing CRPS using the initial diagnostic criteria, the CRPS 1 and 2, and they found that the sensitivity was high, but the specificity was low, and I think it was in the region of 35 or 36 percent, so a lot of false positives if you use that criteria. So they devised these new criteria and put it through rigorous um, uh, rigorous um, studies, and they came up with this current definition, and I pose that this is something that we should be using. It's pretty uh, simple. Four uh, aspects, I'll go through each one in turn. Pain, disproportionate to an event, yes. There are symptoms, that's the second thing. There are signs, that's the third thing. And there's no other diagnosis that can be used to, to explain the symptoms and signs. So pain, symptoms, and signs. And the symptoms and signs are divided into four aspects. There's sensory symptoms, vasomotor symptoms and signs, pseudomotor edema symptoms and signs, motor trophic changes. And, um, and that's the same for symptoms and signs. Now to diagnose, uh, to diagnose this clinically, you need one symptom in three of the four symptoms and to use research diagnostic criteria you need four um, um, one symptom in sorry I'll say that again you need one symptom in three for the clinical diagnostic criteria or four um, so you need all of them uh, for the research diagnostic criteria it gets a bit tricky but it but it is quite simple once you get your head around it and then the signs you need one symptom in two or more Okay, so let's just have a brief look at CRPS 1 and 2. So it is different, and I think the new, the new um, classification is, is probably better. So CRPS 1, CRPS 2, noxious event with or without a nerve injury, pain, hyperalgesia, allodynia, and then basically edema, blood flow abnormalities, and pseudomotor activities all just lumped up into one. So what the Budapest guys did was they separated the criteria. They took vasomotor out and gave its own criteria, and that includes temperature and skin changes. They put pseudomotor and edema together, um, and they put motor and trophic together. Now when they did it this way, what they found is that looking at the sense, the specificity for the clinical diagnostic criteria and then of course the research diagnostic criteria, the specificity increased significantly and that's why it, it is that we should be using um, these um, criteria to define our patients with CRPS. So it's not one or two anymore but it's just CRPS. Now the pathophysiology I'm going to spend a bit of time going over because wherever you read it there are different things and there's a whole heap of possible pathophysiologic processes. There are a couple of good references in your paper in, in your handout where um, it, it's definitely worth a read. But these are the these are how the pathophysiology can be divided. Neurogenic inflammation, changes in cutaneous innervation, so changes in skin density, say. Sensitization, which we'll remind you about. Uh, brain plasticity, which is ph phenomenal and really interesting. Changes to the central nervous system, uh, sorry, changes to the sympathetic nervous system, sympathetic sensory coupling, which could be associated with um, CRPS, genetic aspects and psychological aspects. So let's get started. Inflammation. This is a slide showing you peripheral inflammation that follows peripheral tissue trauma. So you, you've got um, uh, ligand, uh, ligands with non-neuronal sources, so ligands that are released by non-nerve structures following an injury and you can see there bradykine and histamine, serotonin, or adrenaline, cytokines key for inflammation, interleukins 1, 6, tumor necrosis factor. So inflammatory ligands are there. Uh, there are ligands released from within the nerve cells themselves, substance P, CGRP, we've all, we've all read that before. And then they have interactions with receptors on the primary afferent neuron, so receptors on the nerve cells and of course trans transducer channels as well um, but again this is just a reminder the slide is a reminder that this is an in, this could be an inflammatory process and there's a lot of work being done on inflammation in CRPS at the moment there is a study that shows that prednisolone can be useful to to treat CRPS in some cases and um, I found an interesting paper looking at um, 
monoclonal antibodies, some mice, um, uh, mouse monoclonal antibodies that are used to target, and there's the fantastic molecule there, the tumor necrosis factor, um, to treat CRPS, and that's the use of infliximab, so monoclonal antibodies. Um, that's generally used for inflammatory bowel disease, but it has been used for CRPS as well. So changes in cutaneous innervation, punch biopsies have been shown that they change small fiber density uh, in CRPS patients, and this might be associated with um, a pathophysiology, a pathogenesis of CRPS. Sensitization and brain plasticity is key. So when you're talking about CRPS, it's inflammation, it's sensitization, and it's brain plasticity. Those are the key features, really. Sensitization, just a reminder on what it is. Neurons increased responsiveness to normal input or recruitment of uh, neuronal input to a sub-threshold input. So that's pretty standard and that's a, that, that is the definition of sensitization. And of course we know that sensitization can be either peripheral or central and if peripheral sensitization is left unchecked or untreated that can itself lead to central sensitization. So I've just shown you this slide. Now the peripheral sensitization in involves just this, an injury to peripheral tissues. What that injury is in CRPS, we're still not sure about, um, but an injury to non-neuronal and neuronal structures and that itself let, um, uh, starts this cascade of multi, multi uh, sources and multi sources of ligands that sets up changes, so peripheral sensitization. That in itself can lead to central sensitization, and this slide, or this picture, shows you the um, primary afferents um, uh, when they reach the superficial layers of the dorsal horn, um, and you've got glutamate substance P, CGRP, having interactions with the second order neurons, and as you can see there, NMDA is key to central sensitization and it always comes comes up as um, integral to central sensitization. So there's a little reminder the NMDA receptor is key and it has been shown that ketamine uh, NMDA antagonist can treat uh, uh, CRPS in certain cases as well. And when I say treat I don't mean cure, I certainly mean pain reduction. So ketamine good and we'll come back to that later. And that's just another diagram representing changes in the superficial dorsal horn. And that diagram is sprouting. That may or may not be involved. And that was um, certainly one of the key features of a neuropathic pain syndrome. So the deeper, the deeper, um, uh, the 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 deeper um, nerve fibers sprouting up into the more superficial fibers, where you're getting a connection with of nociceptive and non nociceptive uh, neurons. Fantastic picture this. this. These two guys can be found in the London history, uh, the Natural History Museum in London and they're the cortex men or cortex man and they are models that represent the amount of um, uh, uh, area that the homunculus uh, represents. So I'll just uh, essentially if, the, if we grew the way our homunculus looked this is what we would look like. So you've got sensory, which is the red, and the motor model, which is the right. And just compare the motor hands. You can see the motor hands are much bigger than the sensory hands. So that's the that, so that's the cortex man, and that's the way the brain represents the different parts of our body. So face big, hands big. Um, and what happens in CRPS patients, and now that fMRI is being used, um, we are finding uh, phenomenal changes that occur in CRPS patients compared to controls. One of the things that happens, and you'll have a reference of this, is the hand shrinks, the hand cortex representation shrinks and shifts down into the lip area. And um, the hand in this diagram goes from top down because the hand comes up over the um, cerebral cortex or over the top of the homunculus. So all these kind of cortical changes occur, so there's neuroplasticity or brain plasticity and the cortical representation changes and gets reorganized in patients with CRPS. Phenomenal stuff. So CRPS, we must briefly talk about sympathetic, um, sympathetic nervous system changes and the more papers you read, the more confusing it gets and I've just taken a couple of salient points to make it a bit clearer, probably to myself as well. Um, there is vasomotor dysfunction. There could be reduced sympathetic activity early on. 
Um, and that's why you get this warm vasodilated kind of face, which again doesn't occur in everyone. There is definitely some densitivity and sensitivity changes to the alpha adrenergic receptors, and they have found this in previous papers, which I think you'll have a reference to. And then later on, you can get an increased sympathetic activity, so vasoconstricted cold type of um, uh, aspects. This may be because of changes with the sympathetic system. This may be because of changes with the catecholamines or even perhaps nitric oxide. Uh, so sympathetic changes. I found this interesting paper from 2004, and this is the conclusion that this group made. Sympathetic blocks, because we've all heard about people doing sympathetic blocks for patients with CRPS. And this comes back from previously where we were discussing sympathetic maintained pain and non-sympathetically maintained pain. But ultimately, the current thinking for sympathetic blocks is that they are unhelpful in reduction of mechanical... Sorry, they are helpful. They could be helpful in reducing the mechanical allodynia in some of these patients. And this in itself could facilitate um, physiotherapy and occupational therapy. But by themselves, they're not ultimate predictors of treatment response. So sympathetic blocks may be useful, but again, we haven't got enough control studies to guide us into using them for our patients. Now, genetics are important, and this is just a reminder that CRPS can occur in families. There have been associations with a number of HLA um, antigens, common in some CRPS patients, and um, uh, tumor necrosis factor polymorphisms can occur. So the more they look, the more they're finding. That's Sigmund Freud's signature over there, and that's to remind us that psychology does play a role. We're still not sure uh, what the role is, and we're not sure if there's a causal uh, relationship. However, it is clear that our patients are more anxious and more depressed, though that is the CRPS patients. Uh, but again, we don't know enough about the psychology in CRPS. Uh, you've got this referenced. Uh, this is the Brule paper where he tried, I, ho I hope it was a he, he uh, tried to put it all together um, and try and use the pathophysiology to explain a process. And this is how it works, really. You get peripheral changes, so you get the peripheral incident, and that sets up inflammation and peripheral sensitization. You get changes with the hydronergic receptors, you get neuron density changes, and that in itself leads to sympathetic sensory coupling, and it leads to switching on of the sympathetic nervous system, and of course the peripheral sensitization. That in itself can lead to central sensitization. Um, the emotional aspect, the psychological aspects could switch on the sympathetic nervous system, so play a part in that. And once you get to the central area, you get changes in the cortical representation and neuroplasticity of the brain um, cortex. Um, so that could be a way of describing what happens in these patients. And of course, anywhere along the way, genetic predisposition can, um, can play a factor as well. So I quite like that because it puts it all together. Now, I'm not going to spend a lot of time on diagnostic tests. There have been diagnostic tests been done, but the key is, if, if you need to talk about it, there are some imaging things that can be done, x-rays, MRIs, bone scans, and there's some autonomic function testing that can be done. And I think one of the key ones is measuring uh, differences in skin temperature, and I think it's got quite a high specificity if there's a greater than 2.2 degree variation. But again, this is a clinical diagnosis and that's why I've specifically put nothing on the slide because CRPS is a clinical diagnosis at the moment. Now let's get on to the treatments. Um, I found a, f a f fantastic, really good paper looking at uh, current treatments and this was from 2010 and it was by a task force by the Dutch Society of Anesthesiologists and they had a look at evidence-based treatments for CRPS because there's a lot of stuff out there on various treatments and a lot of it is not not good quality um, evidence and this is why the results are as I'm going to show you um, but these are the things that have been used so pharmacology invasive treatments and paramedical These are so this is a summary from that paper, and the paper is worth a read because it does go into slight uh, detail about why it made some of these um, recommendations. But I'll point you to the two underlined um, 
uh, headings, paracetamol and psychological treatments. There is no evidence out there. There is no work that's been done on paracetamol as in a standalone treatment and psychological treatments as well. There is no evidence for anticonvulsants like pregabalin, uh, carbamazepine and phenytoin. We use them but there's no, there's no good evidence and this is according to this, this um, guideline. No evidence for tricyclics as well. We use them but their evidence is not there. No evidence for uh, a rehabilitation medicine approach as well. There is insufficient evidence now for these things uh, outlined in, in orange. So anti-inflammatories, opioids and local anesthetics. Um, we use them. Again, the evidence is not sufficient to say you must use them. Capsaicin is also insufficient evidence. However, there's a new 8% capsaicin being trialed. Um, and it's now being used clinically in places like the UK. Let's wait for, for papers to come out looking at the strong capsaicin in CRPS. You've got oral muscle relaxants, Botox and intrathecal baclofen there and that's for use for the severe dystonias and motor aspects but again insufficient evidence. The more you look the more papers you'll find saying or case reports you'll find saying that it is useful however strictly speaking the evidence is not there and this is according to this paper. Amputation, some people have had their peripheries amputated but again insufficient evidence. And TENS as well, not enough evidence. It is not useful <clears throat> in those three, so IV sympathetic blockade, other IV treatments such as reserpine, droperidol and atropine which have been used and percutaneous sympathetic blockades. However, it is useful and there, are, there, is, there is evidence for these treatments. So ketamine has been useful in some. Gabapentin, if given early and in high doses, doses up to 18, 1800 milligrams per day, can be useful. Now these are the things that don't form part of my pain practice. Radical scavengers, free oxide ra radical scavengers, so uh, dimethyl sulfoxide and acetylcysteine have been used in CRPS pa patients and the evidence does point to it. Uh, DMSO used for the, for the uh, warmer uh, CRPS and N acetylcysteine for the colder CRPS, so that's why it's underlined in red and blue. Corticosteroids have been used, as I've mentioned previously. It doesn't form part of my pain practice, but I need to somehow put this in so I can use it appropriately in my CRPS patients and safely as well. Bisphosphonates and calcium channel blockers, there is evidence for. It's not fantastic evidence, but, it's, but there is evidence. And the calcium channel blockers is the whole vasodilation, vasoconstriction effect, so its effects on vasculature. There is evidence for IV treatments such as ketanserin, which is a 5-HT blocker. Um, surgical sympathectomy evidence for and spinal cord stimulation there is a fair amount of evidence out there for uh, spinal cord stimulation these patients need to be appropriately selected they need to be appropriately screened and they need to have an appropriate trial of the spinal cord stimulation so it doesn't just mean you should go out there and do it you need to put them through the rigorous um, build up to spinal cord stimulation and then physiotherapy, occupational therapy, yes. So when you see a patient, what are you going to do? Well, I pose to you, you do your five-pronged approach. You treat the medical aspects, you treat the physical aspects, you treat the functional, psychosocial aspects, and of course education is key. But it's ultimately pain reduction, and you might choose one of these treatments with um, mobilization and an approach to getting the patient functioning again. That is key in CRPS. You've got to get them moving again. And if you use something to reduce the pain while you get them moving again, excellent. Um, one last thing, calcitonin. The evidence is conflicting, so we're not even going to go there. Now this paper goes on to recommend a discussion on primary prevention and secondary prevention as well, which I think is pretty interesting. Um, there is evidence for vitamin C, 500 milligrams per day for 50 days following an injury such as a wrist fracture as a primary preventative measure for CRPS. I don't see it being done. I'm not sure if it needs to be done on all my patients, all the patients coming out of ED, particularly the uh, ladies with upper limb uh, distal fractures. I don't know, but it is, there is evidence out there um, and perhaps we need to look more closely at this.
no evidence for guanethidine, no evidence for subcutaneous calcitonin. So as you can see, not many papers and studies have been done for preventing CRPS, but we may be getting there. And then secondary prevention. So the this task force, the opinion, and I'm going to read this out. It says that operations should be postponed until CRPS-1, because that's what this paper was on, and we know that 90% of CRPS is CRPS-1. Interestingly, in 2010, this paper's coming out, and they're still talking about CRPS-1. So this whole Budapest criteria just hasn't been taken up, and I'm not sure why that is. Um, operations are postponed until the signs are minimal. So if you've got somebody with CRPS and you're going to have an operation, wait until they're better or wait until they've improved somewhat or their signs are minimal. And then the use of um, regional anesthetic techniques does make sense. So brachial plexus blocks, epidurals. It just makes sense that we minimize the post-operative pain and the initial peripheral sensitization that can occur and make things worse. There is an indication as a secondary prevention that stellate blocks and intravenous regional anesthesia, analgesia, with clonidine can offer protection as well. So perhaps when we do our blocks, we should be putting in a bit of clonidine. Again, no evidence to guide us. Multimodal analgesia works for prevention, or there are indications that it works. And interestingly, daily subcut calcitonin can prevent a relapse. And again, I don't know where this is going to fit into my practice or our practice, but we need to think about ways of making it so. Briefly about children. Um, children are not my um, uh, forte. I don't see children. But the, the bit that you should know, the basics are it occurs in young, particularly young girls, 9 to 15. It's a lower limb problem as opposed to the adults, which is slightly more upper limb. 90% of kids with CRPS get better, but they can reoccur. And the main thing with kids are probably some medication to reduce the, the pain, but it's about movement, physiotherapy, occupational therapy. You've got to get there moving. That is paramount. Um, there's no conclusions with psychological treatments, and that's because of the way some of the studies were put together. But my understanding, talking to PEDS uh, pain specialists, is that we shouldn't be putting needles in kids. Um, physio, OT, and probably some analgesia to reduce things. So probably things like anti uh, uh, gabapentinoids and membrane stabilizers. Well that concludes this um, presentation.